what's going on here? This whole area just emptied right out. <laughs> I, I got deodorant on. I put that on this morning. <laughs> All right. So we're in a series, Love Looks Like Something. At the beginning of this thing, I spoke some words that I felt God had said over this house. And some of the things that he's doing here and some of the things that he's making here, he's creating here. And he spoke words like, this will be a house of freedom. This will be a house of, of power and miracles and signs and wonders and all those awesome things. But what he's doing right now is he is really going down to the core level of each one of us. Uh, surgery hurts sometimes. We spoke about his great love for us and how, how it, we were the joy that was set before him when he gave Jesus to die on the cross. And that was that word, that agape love, that, that, that word that you, you can't work for it. All you can do is receive it. And whether you want it or not, it is poured out on you. And it is continually poured out on you. And that's just going to get stronger and stronger. We spoke about contentions in the church and how there are constantly people that are pointing out issues with this church and with that church and with this church instead of just letting the main thing be the main thing. And let's stop getting all wrapped up in these theological debates and whatnot and let's just love each other and let God do what He wants to do. We talked about how, how churches, and, and actually not just churches, anywhere, you've got the social norms of, of the social hierarchies where these people are in this group and these people are in that group, and then you've got loners that are all off in the back. And it's never how it was meant to be. We're all supposed to be together as one. It's not like, it's not supposed to be all separated. That's not how the kingdom works. You look, and in, in, I, I guarantee you, when you leave this place, you search through this entire city. You find one person that Jesus didn't die for. There's not one. That means they're your brother. They're your sister. They need an encounter with him. And you might be that encounter. Hmm. We said love looks like something. It's the ability to put aside theological debates and social norms and realize that God has us all at different places in our walks. And he'll deal with the thinking of people. Last week we looked at Abraham. He and Sarah, they were waiting for the promise from God for 25 years. 25 years they waited for Isaac. Sarah carried him for nine months. She bonded with him. 99 years old, pregnant with a baby. <laughs> 99 years old. The baby was born, and the baby hung out with his father, and, and father taught him all the things of God. And at, at 15 years old, God said to Abraham, Hey, I want you to take that baby who is now 15 years old, and I want you to tie him on the altar and sacrifice him to me. And how hard that must have been for him. We talked about a young priest's daughter getting pregnant by another priest. They had dedicated their whole lives to God. And then she gets pregnant. And the order comes down that all the Israelite male children would be killed. So she carried that baby for nine months wondering, is it a girl or a boy? If it's a girl, we're okay. If it's a boy, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then Moses was born. For three months, she hid him, able to hide what his gender was. But then she couldn't hide him anymore, so she put him in a basket and let him go. Talked about Paul, his life as a religious leader. A Hebrew of Hebrews, trained under Gamaliel, 
rich in money and stature. He had everything going for him. And then God knocked him off his horse and said, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. And his entire life at that point, because that was a no-no, was changed. How all three of them, Isaac, Moses, and Paul, their lives were put directly in the hands of God. And we said, okay, God, what is it that you're calling us to put down on the altar today? Because all of us are carrying something that belongs in his hands that you're still trying to deal with. You're still trying to work on. I hope you're all able to go home and spend some time with him and figure out what that thing was. Is it a relationship? Is it your finances? Is it your job? Is it your housing situation? What is it that he is calling you to put down at his altar? Is it a ministry? Is it building a name for yourself? Is it a business? What is he calling you to put down in his hand and to trust him with? <laughs> the truth is, is we saw that all three of those men, all three of their stories led to major moves of God when they were completely left into God's hand, they all created major moves of God. Isaac, Moses, and Paul. What could he do with whatever it is that you're carrying that you need to just put in his hand? Because love looks like something. And in that place, it's sacrifice. Sometimes it's just sacrificing your way of thinking, your way of understanding. I'm going to try not to be as heavy as I was last week because I felt heavy in here last week. I know it was a lot. But the truth is, is I, I can only speak what I feel God is sharing with me. You guys are getting me. You're, you're getting real time. So if that's not good for you, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I'm not. Huh. If you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 16... I, I want to show you something that he's been working on me with. And I'll give you some context to Matthew 16 because love still looks like something. It doesn't just look like sacrifice. It doesn't just look like getting by the social norms. It doesn't just look like getting by theological debates. It looks like so many other things. And in Matthew 16, let me give you some context. Jesus' ministry was in full swing. He was walking up the seacoast of Galilee. Thousands of people were following him. They were bringing their sick, bringing their, their, their lame, bringing their, their deaf, their blind, bringing them all to Jesus. And Scripture says that he healed every one. And the word spread. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands came. It's funny, as he's walking up the coast and healing all these people, the scripture says that he had compassion on them. He saw all of them there. Scripture says it was about 4,000 men. Now add women and children to that. You've got about 12,000 people on average. And Jesus looked at them and he had compassion on them and he looked at his disciples and he said, feed them. And they said, we've got seven fish and a few loaves. What do you mean, feed them? He said, sit them down and feed them. And he miraculously multiplied food. How many of you know that God still does that today? Yes. Like if you haven't seen this, Google Iris Ministries, Heidi Baker, and take a look at what she's doing in Mozambique, Africa, where every single day they rely on God to multiply the food that they put out. That's, that's no joke. Every single day. And they've got themselves in the place where they've got a capacity to believe for God to do that. What could he do with your situation? <laughs> he had compassion on him. It says he fed every single one of them through those seven loaves and a few fish. 
And it said they had tons left over besides. It's funny because here he is. He's got 12,000 people at least and his 12 disciples. And he feeds all these people. And then scripture says he got in a boat and left. He didn't, he didn't just leave the 12,000. He left the 12 disciples there also. He got in a boat and took off. Sometimes God does the opposite of what you're expecting. Is that the case? Or is it that sometimes we put an expectation on him to do things a certain way and he may have a completely different idea of how he wants to do things? And in that place, instead of getting worried and upset that he didn't do it the way that I wanted him to do it, how about you just trust him? That he's got another way to do this thing and you're not God. Scripture says that the natural mind doesn't perceive the things of God. We can't understand. How many of you have ever looked at something and said, God, why did that happen? How many of us have said this is going to be a day when I get to get up there, I'm going to ask a whole load of questions? Yeah, you can throw that out because when you get up there, you're going to be on your face. <laughs> it's a good thing. He gets in the boat and he leaves the disciples with the multitudes. And scripture says that he came to the region of Magdala. While he's there, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out. They're waiting for him. He's by himself now. No thousands, no disciples. And they come out and it says they came out to test him. And they said to him, hey, Jesus, I want you to show us a sign. They were trying to prove him wrong, that he really wasn't who he said he was. You've got to remember something here, guys. Jesus wasn't falling for it. We shouldn't either. The enemy is constantly trying to trip you up and get you into the performance mentality. If you're really this, well then do that. If you are what you say you are, if your God is who he says he is, then show me this or show me that. Listen, I, I don't have to perform anything for you. It's good enough for Jesus. He pretty much told him to go jump in the lake. I guess I can do the same. Actually, what he did was he pointed him to the scriptures and said, go check it out yourself. But I don't need to give you a sign. So while he's being questioned by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the twelve finally caught up with him. How many of you understand that there are times that we need to catch up with him? Amen. There are times when we want to lag behind in what God is doing, and it's so amazing, but the truth is he's already moved on to the next thing. There's something to be said in that, guys. There are times when God has moved in such a major way and you just want to stay there in that place and he's like, yeah, let's get to the next thing. Come on, churches and religions have gotten stuck in moves of God because God has moved on and they're still looking for it to happen the way that they expect it to happen. <laughs> the disciples finally caught up with him in Magdala. And Jesus says to them, after he was questioned by the Pharisees, he says to them, hey guys, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And the disciples were still thinking about what God had, or, had just done. And they automatically went to, oh crap, I didn't bring any of the bread with us. Did you? No, nope, I didn't bring it. Well, did you? No, nobody brought it. He had just had this massive miracle where 12,000 people were fed loaves and fishes and they thought, oh, He's asking for the bread. I didn't bring the bread. Did you bring the bread? No, I didn't bring the bread. They were still so focused on what God had just done, they were missing what God was doing in the moment. Come on, guys. We've got to get to that place where we're with him in the moment. And understanding his character. Jesus says to him, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And when they said we didn't bring the bread, it says Jesus realized what they were thinking and said to him, guys, I'm not talking about bread. 
He said, I've, do you forget what I did? He said, I fed the 5,000, which turned out to be 15,000 or so. I fed the 4,000 with just a few loaves and fishes. I fed all these people with just a little bit. And then you had tons that you could pick up. Did you forget all of that? It was then that the disciples realized, oh, he was talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. He wasn't talking about bread. He was talking about something much deeper. He was talking about something that can break the Christian life if you let it, and that's religion. It's in this place where we find the story that I want to look at this morning. Because from that place where Jesus said, you know, it's, it's where they realized it's the doctrine. It says that they left that place, Magdala, and they went to Caesarea Philippi, which is about 10 miles away. So they traveled for 10 miles by foot. I don't know if they talked or not. Scripture doesn't say. But for 10 miles, they had to think of, man, we messed that one up. He was trying to show us about religion. All we were thinking about was the miracles. So for 10 miles, they walked with him. And it says when they got there, let me read, read the text to Caesarea. Here's another thing that I want to make sure I point out. You've got to understand the times that they were in also. Context is important. If you read scripture out of context, you're going to get it twisted up. These guys were under the rule of Herod the Great at this point. Herod the Great was appointed the king of Judea by the Roman emperor. Herod was a Jew, but he favored the Roman government. And the Roman emperor said, that's my man right there. And he made him king of Judea. A lot of people would look at him as a traitor or as a turncoat because he did what was best for him. That's the rule that, that they were under at this point. Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, which is where our story takes place, was renamed by Herod the Great's son, Philip. So the original place was something completely different. So here you have a place that was completely redefined by a person who has no idea who they are, lost his complete sense of identity. And Jesus walks into this place with his 12 disciples, and Scripture says that he was alone with them. And in verse 13, it says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus looked at each one of them and he said, but who do you say that I am? Come on, guys. This is where it all goes down. Who do you say that he is? Amen. Who is he to you? Come on, guys, there's going to come a day when you're going to stand in front of him. Nobody else with you, just you. Who do you say that he is? See, I grew up understanding God a certain way, but I understood him through my mother. And it was twisted. It's not her fault. That's what she believed at the time. But I learned to understand him a certain way, and this is who he was. But if you were to ask me, who do you say that I am? Well, I say what she says. Right. Well, he looked at the disciples and he said, no, who do you say that I am? Because the Pharisees had just questioned him that whole time. Hey, I want you to do this to prove who you are. Something in that sparked Jesus to say, I'm going to take these 12 who I've been intimate with and I've spent all this time with, and I need to know where their hearts are. And he looked at them and said, who do you say that I am? 
You just told me what everybody else is saying. Who do you say that I am? Who is he to you? Is he just somebody you come and meet on Sunday? Is he somebody you meet when you occasionally go out for outreach? Is he somebody that you tell people is your God, but you live the opposite way? Or is he completely real to you in, in every single aspect of your life? Because believe it or not, he wants to be in every single aspect of your life. Good and bad. But what happens is, is we fall into these things and we make a mess out of certain things and we may fall back in a certain lifestyle, whatever it is, and we automatically say, that wall is up now, I can't be with you. That's not who he is. Who do you say that he is? It's not who I say he is. It's not who the person on your left or the right says he is. Who do you say he is? See, it's a question where we're all at right now. And until you figure out who he is to you, you're probably going to stay stuck. Because the truth is, he's freedom. Amen. He's life. He's hope. Amen. Yes. And if you've got no freedom, no life, no hope in your life, then you don't have him. And it's by choice, guys. Huh. See, in the question, there's also an invitation for more. Jesus looks at them and he says, who do you say that I am? This is why it is so important to read scripture with Holy Spirit. You can read through the scripture. And how many, of you, how many of you get text messages? How many of you have gotten text messages in caps? Caps, capitals. And what do you think when you get a text message in caps? That person's ticked off. Or they really want me to understand that. We don't go to the place of they might have just hit the caps lock button by accident. We automatically go to, <laughs> this person's ticked off. See, when you read scripture with Holy Spirit, and you actually read through something, and it spurs something in you, and you go, man, I want to know what that means. That's the time when you sit with him and say, hey, Jesus said he was going to go, and he was going to send another, and he was going to guide you and teach you and lead you into all truth. His name is Holy Spirit, and he's there to read scripture with you. See, the word is the word, but it is brought life when the spirit breathes on it. And when you can sit with him and say, Holy Spirit, what was really going on here? That's how you're meant to read the word. Otherwise, it just becomes... A page after a page after a page. See, the word is alive. Scripture says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And what brings it life is the spirit that breathes on it. Hmm. It's an invitation for more. See, my Bible says that he is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is the Almighty with an unending supply of finances, resources, and everything else that I'll ever need to walk this life out that He's planned for me. So if I haven't met Him yet in those places, then there's an invitation here to go further because He wants you to be able to say, give a full answer when He says, who do you say that I am? See, I can say you're the God that healed that friend of mine or you're the God that took care of that cousin of mine or you're the God that I read that story about. But who is he to you? Because he wants to be in the middle of your life in every single aspect of it. See, it's John 17, 3, guys. It says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, 
the only true God and the Christ whom you have sent. That eternal life, that's that intimate word. See, love looks like something, guys. And in this case, it looks like intimacy with him. Intimacy with him is missing in the body. I want you to think about that for a second. Life comes out of intimacy. And if you're not intimate with him, there's no life coming out, guys. This is what he wants. He wants it to be just you and him. See, Peter, Peter said, I got the answer for you. Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. When Jesus looked at him and said, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. He didn't say you might be. He didn't say that you might turn out to be in the future, but I'm not quite sure yet. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. See, in that place, Peter leaned back on his history with Christ. He leaned back on the time when Christ walked by and said, follow me, Peter. He leaned back on the time that he was with Peter walking, and Peter watched him heal people left and right, raise the dead, preach the kingdom, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Peter had been with him in those places. Peter leaned back on the times when Jesus had given him authority and said, you go and you do it. And the disciples went out two by two and they healed the sick. They cleansed the lepers. They raised the dead and they came back all excited about all they had done. Peter leaned on that in that moment and said, you are the Christ. See, his history, his intimacy, his time with Christ is what led him to that understanding. Where is your time with Christ leading you now? And if you're leaning on religion and just reading the right amount or attending at the right times, your life is always going to be stuck. There's no life coming out of that, guys. See, intimacy is two-way. It takes two to tango. It is two-way, guys. Communication with Him, intimacy with Him is two-way. But so many times we get before him and we just read through our list of wants and desires and we say, good night, amen. <clears throat> Instead of giving him a chance to speak. How many of you have ever, you don't have to put your hands up here, but how many of you have ever actually sat there down to pray and said, you know what, time out. God, how do you want me to pray today? Do you think he didn't hear you the 30 or 40 times you've already prayed for that other thing? And he may have you pray for it again. There's something about contending for breakthrough, sure. But when you're able to sit with him and say, how do you want to pray? And he'll lead you down a path if you let him. It's intimacy, guys. That's what he's looking for. Love looks like something. But the truth is, is what we've got on us is all our issues and all our past and all the things we're going through. And it clouds you from seeing who you really are. And when you can't see who you really are, you automatically think that you're not worthy of intimacy with him. But he wants you free. When Jesus died on that cross, he said, it is finished, it is done, which means everything that you've done, everything that you've sinned against, all that stuff has been broken off of you. Leave it dead in the grave. Stop bringing it forward with you. He wants you free. He wants you intimate with him. He wants your mind set on him rather than the issues and the problems. He doesn't want you to constantly try to figure everything out on your own. You weren't created for that. You were created to be intimate with him. And realize when he is moving on to the next thing, you're supposed to go with him, not stay with what he did before. 
See, he looked at the disciples. He said, who do you say that I am? Peter leaned on everything that he had been through, everything that he had done with him, and it brought him to that one conclusion. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the risen one, the anointed one, the one chosen by God to bring Savior to all people. I mean, how humble must have Peter felt in that moment? when he made the declaration that would change everything in his life, that you are the Messiah, you are the chosen one, you are the Savior. Everything he had been through with Jesus led him to that moment, and that moment happened. And he said, you are the Christ, you are the risen one, you are the, the, the anointed one, you are the Messiah. From that point on, Jesus answered him, and he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who was in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not stand against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. See, the revelation of who Jesus was to Peter unlocked his destiny in the kingdom. When Peter finally got it, that this is who he was, his future was completely opened up to him in that point. Jesus made a declaration right back at him, here's who you are. See, when you can truly understand who he is, he'll truly define who you are in greater detail than you've ever had before. Most of us are trying to figure out what our purpose is or what the point is for us being here or what it is that I'm supposed to do or what it is that I'm supposed to carry and I'm not really sure about this. Man, the revelation of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you understand who Jesus is, he will define who you are and he will bring greater, greater clarity and vision than you've ever expected before. Hmm. See, the funny thing is, is there's no coincidence to this place. Amen. There's no coincidence Amen. to the call to intimacy here. When Jesus pulled the 12 aside and said, who do you say I am? Peter hopped in and gave the answer right away. Who knows what the other 11 did? But they had an invitation at that point. They heard what Peter said. And I bet you something in them went, oh, he's definitely right. I wish I said that. See, but God was preparing him for what was coming in the future. Watch how this works. Years later, Acts chapter 10. You don't have to turn here. A man named Cornelius has a vision. And in that vision, an angel says, says to him, I want you to send and go get Peter and bring him to you. See, Cornelius was a Gentile. And Cornelius says, I want you to go, uh, he gets this vision from this angel that says, I want you to send somebody and go get Peter, and I want you to do whatever he says. So Cornelius sends three guys, and at the same time, Peter is up on a rooftop at a house. And he's just sitting there with God, and it says that Peter fell into a trance. Boom, slain in the spirit. There you go. It's in the Bible. It must be real. Well, that was a good one. Either way, here he is on the rooftop, and it says, Peter fell into a trance, and he saw this sheet coming down. And on that sheet, it had hoofed animals and stuff like that, and he heard, arise, Peter, kill and eat. He heard the angels say that, and Peter's like, oh, Jews don't do that. Because Jews didn't eat certain types of animals. And he heard it three times. And I'm, I'm shortening this for sake of time, guys. So while he's up there, he hears a knock at the door. And it's the three men that Cornelius had sent for him. And the angel says to Peter, there are three men at the door, I want you to go with them and do whatever they tell you. Like Peter had no idea where he was being taken at that point. And they take Peter, he goes downstairs, and they take him all the way to Cornelius. 
And he walks into Cornelius in the city of Caesarea. God brought him full circle. It was the very place where Peter made the declaration that you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. God brought him right back to that very same place to pass that revelation on to the next generation. Come on, guys. It's so important that we understand who he is because somebody down the road is going to be in the exact same place that you are. And you're going to be able to say, I was here, I was in this place, and in this place, I got a revelation of who he is. And it changed everything because when that revelation came in, he gave full destiny, full understanding of who I'm supposed to be and everything that he had for me. Peter had traveled all over the place. And God said, hey, I'm going to now send you to the Gentiles, which was a no-no. But the three men, can you imagine what Peter must have been thinking when they started traveling? And he's like, wait a minute, we're headed to a place that looks like I've been here before. I remember this encounter I had with Jesus here. And he said, who do you say that I am? And as Cornelius takes him in the door, he says, listen, I don't know why you're here, but I know that I fear God and I trust him. And he said to go get you. And I want you to come speak to me and my entire family. He had filled his house full of Gentiles. And Peter gave a word that wrecked that entire household. God is waiting for you and I to figure out who he truly is. Because there are people in the exact same circumstance that you and I are in that need the freedom that we are carrying. But it all came from intimacy with Christ. Love looks like something, guys. And it is intimacy with him. It is one-on-one -on -one intimacy with him. It's not what can I do with him to see what I can get out of it. That would be intimacy for profit. Which is also called prostitution. This is intimacy out of relationship. And when you have intimacy out of relationship, it births life. And that's what we're created for. Hmm. I don't know where to go from here. I'm not going to lie. I just, I know what the cry of his heart is. And I know the more that you look at what other people are doing and how they affect you and what their decisions are and the things that they do and how they drive you crazy, it's because you are completely missing who you are to him. Who do you say that I am? It's not, well, why can't they get it? It's not, well, why can't they figure out how spiritual we're supposed to be? Who do you say that he is? Amen. Who is he to you? He wants to open up deeper revelation and understanding of who he is. He wants to change everything, and he wants to use you and I to do it. You're created to carry His love and His grace everywhere you go. You're not created to worry about what Joe is doing or what Fred is doing or what Sarah is doing or what my mother did to me or what my brother did to me or how they're not going along on the way that I want them to go or they're not saying the right things. They're not doing it the way that I would do it. No, He wants to be intimate with you. Who do you say that I am? Because when you understand who he is, he will define who you clearly are. And he'll bring greater clarity and vision and you will walk that thing out. And he'll bring you right back to the spot where you are so you can release it to somebody else. Hmm. Father, we love you, God. We thank you for your great grace, God. Father, I thank you for the call to intimacy. Father, I thank you that love does look like something and in this case, God, it looks like your cry for us for intimacy. Your longing desire for us to pull away to be alone with you one-on-one, -on -one, just like Jesus did. Father, I thank you for encounters that are being released in this room right now, God. Father, I thank you for people being woken up in the middle of the night just so you can love on them. 
I thank you for hearts that will put down their understanding and just come after you. And stop worrying about what everybody else is doing and just come after you. I thank you for God. Great grace. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Hmm. I got some handouts here.